Brown Wolf by Jack London She had delayed, because of the duet grass, in order to put on her overshoes, and when she emerged from the house found her waiting husband absorbed in the wonder of a bursting almond bud. She sent a questing glance across the tall grass and in and out among the orchard trees. Where's Wolf? she asked. He was here a moment ago. Walt Irvine drew himself away with a jerk from the metaphysics and poetry of the organic miracle of blossom, and surveyed the landscape. He was running a rabbit the last I saw of him. Wolf! Wolf! Here Wolf, she called, as they left the clearing and took the trail that led down through the waxen belled manzanita jungle to the county road. Irvine thrust between his lips the little finger of each hand and lent to her efforts a shrill whistling. She covered her ears hastily and made a wry grimace. My! For a poet, delicately attuned and all the rest of it, you can make unlovely noises. My eardrums are pierced. You outwhistle. Orpheus. I was about to say a street Arab, she concluded severely. Poesy does not prevent one from being practical, at least it doesn't prevent me. Mine is no futility of genius that can't sell gems to the magazines. He assumed a mock extravagance, and went on. I am no attic singer, no ballroom warbler. And why? Because I am practical. Mine is no squalor of song that cannot transmute itself, with proper exchange value, into a flower-crowned cottage, a sweet mountain meadow, a grove of redwoods, an orchard of thirty-seven trees one long row of blackberries and two short rows of strawberries, to say nothing of a quarter of a mile of gurgling brook. I am a beauty merchant, a trader in song, and I pursue utility, dear Madge. I sing a song, and thanks to the magazine editors I transmute my song into a waft of the west wind sighing through our redwoods, into a murmur of waters over mossy stones that sings back to me another song than the one I sang and yet the same song wonderfully, eh, transmuted. Oh that all your song transmutations were as successful, she laughed. Name one that wasn't. Those two beautiful sonnets that you transmuted into the cow that was accounted the worst milker in the township. She was beautiful, he began. But she didn't give milk, Madge interrupted. But she was beautiful, now, wasn't she, he insisted. And here's where beauty and utility fall out, was her reply. And there's the wolf. From the thicket-covered hillside came a crashing of underbrush, and then, forty feet above them, on the edge of the sheer wall of rock, appeared a wolf's head and shoulders. His braced forepaws dislodged a pebble, and with sharp pricked ears and peering eyes he watched the fall of the pebble till it struck at their feet. Then he transferred his gaze and with open mouth laughed down at them. You wolf, you, and you blessed wolf, the man and woman called out to him. The ears flattened back and down at the sound, and the head seemed to snuggle under the caress of an invisible hand. They watched him scramble backward into the thicket, then proceeded on their way. Several minutes later, rounding a turn in the trail where the descent was less precipitous, he joined them in the midst of a miniature avalanche of pebbles and loose soil. He was not demonstrative. A pat and a rub around the ears from the man, and a more prolonged caressing from the woman, and he was away down the trail in front of them, gliding effortlessly over the ground in true wolf fashion. In build and coat and brush he was a huge timber wolf, but the lie was given to his wolfhood by his colour and marking. There the dog unmistakably advertised itself. No wolf was ever coloured like him. He was brown, deep brown, red brown, an orgy of browns. Back and shoulders were a warm brown that paled on the sides and underneath to a yellow that was dingy because of the brown that lingered in it. The white of the throat and paws and the spots over the eyes was dirty because of the persistent and ineradicable brown, while the eyes themselves were twin topazes, golden and brown. The man and woman loved the dog very much, perhaps this was because it had been such a task to win his love. It had been no easy matter when he first drifted in mysteriously out of nowhere to their little mountain cottage. 
Footsore and famished, he had killed a rabbit under their very noses and under their very windows, and then crawled away and slept by the spring at the foot of the blackberry bushes. When Walt Irvine went down to inspect the intruder, he was snarled at for his pains, and Madge likewise was snarled at when she went down to present, as a peace offering, a large pan of bread and milk. A most unsociable dog he proved to be, resenting all their advances, refusing to let them lay hands on him, menacing them with bared fangs and bristling hair. Nevertheless he remained, sleeping and resting by the spring, and eating the food they gave him after they set it down at a safe distance and retreated. His wretched physical condition explained why he lingered, and when he had recuperated, after several days' sojourn, he disappeared. And this would have been the end of him, so far as Irvine and his wife were concerned, had not Irvine at that particular time been called away into the northern part of the state. Riding along on the train, near to the line between California and Oregon, he chanced to look out of the window and saw his unsociable guest sliding along the wagon road, brown and wolfish, tired yet tireless, dust-covered and soiled with two hundred miles of travel. Now Irvine was a man of impulse, a poet. He got off the train at the next station, bought a piece of meat at a butcher shop, and captured the vagrant on the outskirts of the town. The return trip was made in the baggage car, and so Wolf came a second time to the mountain cottage. Here he was tied up for a week and made love to by the man and woman. But it was very circumspect lovemaking. Remote and alien as a traveller from another planet, he smiled down their soft-spoken love words. He never barked. In all the time they had him he was never known to bark. To win him became a problem. Irvine liked problems. He had a metal plate made, on which was stamped, Return to Walt Irvine, Glen Ellen, Sonoma County, California. This was riveted to a collar and strapped about the dog's neck. Then he was turned loose, and promptly he disappeared. A day later came a telegram from Mendocino County. In twenty hours he had made over a hundred miles to the north, and was still going when captured. He came back by Wells Fargo Express, was tied up three days, and was loosed on the fourth and lost. This time he gained southern Oregon before he was caught and returned. Always, as soon as he received his liberty, he fled away, and always he fled north. He was possessed of an obsession that drove him north. The homing instinct, Irvine called it, after he had expended the selling price of a sonnet in getting the animal back from northern Oregon. Another time the brown wanderer succeeded in traversing half the length of California, all of Oregon, and most of Washington, before he was picked up and returned collect. A remarkable thing was the speed with which he traveled. Fed up and rested, as soon as he was loosed he devoted all his energy to getting over the ground. On the first day's run he was known to cover as high as 150 miles, and after that he would average 100 miles a day until caught. He always arrived back lean and hungry and savage, and always departed fresh and vigorous, cleaving his way northward in response to some prompting of his being that no one could understand. But at last, after a futile year of flight, he accepted the inevitable and elected to remain at the cottage where first he had killed the rabbit and slept by the spring. Even after that, a long time elapsed before the man and woman succeeded in patting him. It was a great victory, for they alone were allowed to put hands on him. He was fastidiously exclusive, and no guest at the cottage ever succeeded in making up to him. A low growl greeted such approach, if anyone had the hardihood to come nearer, the lips lifted, the naked fangs appeared, and the growl became a snarl, a snarl so terrible and malignant that it awed the stoutest of them as it likewise awed the farmer's dogs that knew ordinary dog snarling, but had never seen wolf snarling before. He was without antecedents. His history began with Walt and Madge. He had come up from the south, but never a clue did they get of the owner from whom he had evidently fled. Mrs. Johnson, their nearest neighbor and the one who supplied them with milk, proclaimed him a Klondike dog. Her brother was borrowing for frozen pastries in that far country, and so she constituted herself an authority on the subject. But they did not dispute her. There were the tips of wolf's ears, obviously so severely frozen at some time that they would never quite heal again. 
Besides, he looked like the photographs of the Alaskan dogs they saw published in magazines and newspapers. They often speculated over his past, and tried to conjure up, from what they had read and heard, what his Northland life had been. That the Northland still drew him, they knew, for at night they sometimes heard him crying softly, and when the north wind blew and the bite of frost was in the air, a great restlessness would come upon him and he would lift a mournful lament which they knew to be the long wolf howl. Yet he never barked. No provocation was great enough to draw from him that canine cry. Long discussion they had, during the time of winning him, as to whose dog he was. Each claimed him, and each proclaimed loudly any expression of affection made by him. But the man had the better of it at first, chiefly because he was a man. It was patent that Wolf had had no experience with women. He did not understand women. Madge's skirts were something he never quite accepted. The swish of them was enough to set him a bristle with suspicion, and on a windy day she could not approach him at all. On the other hand, it was Madge who fed him, also it was she who ruled the kitchen, and it was by her favour, and her favour alone, that he was permitted to come within that sacred precinct. It was because of these things that she bade fair to overcome the handicap of her garments. Then it was that Walt put forth special effort, making it a practice to have Wolf lie at his feet while he wrote, and, between petting and talking, losing much time from his work. Walt won in the end, and his victory was most probably due to the fact that he was a man, though Madge averred that they would have had another quarter of a mile of gurgling brook, and at least two west winds sighing through their redwoods, had Waite properly devoted his energies to song transmutation and left Wolf alone to exercise a natural taste and an unbiased judgment. It's about time I heard from those triolets, Walt said, after a silence of five minutes, during which they had swung steadily down the trail. There'll be a check at the post office, I know, and we'll transmute it into beautiful buckwheat flour, a gallon of maple syrup, and a new pair of overshoes for you. And into beautiful milk from Mrs. Johnson's beautiful cow, Madge added. Tomorrow's the first of the month, you know. Walt scowled unconsciously, then his face brightened, and he clapped his hand to his breast pocket. Never mind. I have here a nice beautiful new cow, the best milker in California. When did you write it? She demanded eagerly. Then, reproachfully, and you never showed it to me. I saved it to read to you on the way to the post office, in a spot remarkably like this one, he answered, indicating, with a wave of his hand, a dry log on which to sit. A tiny stream flowed out of a dense fern break, slipped down a mossalipped stone, and ran across the path at their feet. From the valley arose the mellow song of meadowlarks, while about them, in and out, through sunshine and shadow, fluttered great yellow butterflies. Up from below came another sound that broke in upon Walt reading softly from his manuscript. It was a crunching of heavy feet, punctuated now and again by the clattering of a displaced stone. As Walt finished and looked to his wife for approval, a man came into view around the turn of the trail. He was bareheaded and sweaty. With a handkerchief in one hand he mopped his face, while in the other hand he carried a new hat and a wilted starched collar which he had removed from his neck. He was a well-built man, and his muscles seemed on the point of bursting out of the painfully new and ready-made black clothes he wore. Warm day, Walt greeted him. Walt believed in country democracy, and never missed an opportunity to practice it. The man paused and nodded. I guess I ain't used much to the warm, he vouchsafed half apologetically. I'm more accustomed to zero weather. You don't find any of that in this country, Walt laughed. Should say not, the man answered. And I ain't here a eh, looking for it neither. I'm trying to find my sister. Meb you know where she lives. Her name's Johnson, Mrs. William Johnson. You're not her Klondike brother. Madge cried, her eyes bright with interest, about whom we've heard so much. Yes em, that's me he answered modestly. My name's Miller, Skiff Miller. I just thought I'd surprise her. You are on the right track then. 
Only you've come by the footpath. Madge stood up to direct him, pointing up the canyon a quarter of a mile. You see that blasted redwood? Take the little trail turning off to the right. It's the short cut to her house. You can't miss it. Yes, M, thank you, M, he said. He made tentative efforts to go, but seemed awkwardly rooted to the spot. He was gazing at her with an open admiration of which he was quite unconscious, and which was drowning, along with him, in the rising sea of embarrassment in which he floundered. We'd like to hear you tell about the Klondike, Madge said. Mayn't we come over some day while you are at your sister's? Or, better yet, won't you come over and have dinner with us? Yes, M, thank you, M, he mumbled mechanically. Then he caught himself up and added, I ain't stopping long. I got to be pulling north again. I go out on tonight's train. You see, I've got a mail contract with the government. When Madge had said that it was too bad, he made another futile effort to go. But he could not take his eyes from her face. He forgot his embarrassment in his admiration, and it was her turn to flush and feel uncomfortable. It was at this juncture, when Walt had just decided it was time for him to be saying something to relieve the strain, that Wolf, who had been away nosing through the brush, trotted wolf-like into view. Skiff Miller's abstraction disappeared. The pretty woman before him passed out of his field of vision. He had eyes only for the dog, and a great wonder came into his face. Well, I'll be damned, he enunciated slowly and solemnly. He sat down ponderingly on the log, leaving Madge standing. At the sound of his voice, Wolf's ears had flattened down, then his mouth had opened in a laugh. He trotted slowly up to the stranger and first smelled his hands, then licked them with his tongue. Skiff Miller patted the dog's head, and slowly and solemnly repeated, Well, I'll be damned. Excuse me, he said the next moment I was just as prized son, that was all. We're surprised, too, she answered lightly. We never saw Wolf make up to a stranger before. Is that what you call him, Wolf? the man asked. Madge nodded. But I can't understand his friendliness toward you unless it's because you're from the Klondike. He's a Klondike dog, you know. Yes, M, Miller said absently. He lifted one of Wolf's four legs and examined the footpads, pressing them and denting them with his thumb. Kind of soft, he remarked. He ain't been on trail for a long time. I say, Walt broke in, it is remarkable the way he lets you handle him. Skiff Miller arose, no longer awkward with admiration of Madge, and in a sharp, business-like manner asked, how long have you had him? But just then the dog, squirming and rubbing against the newcomer's legs, opened his mouth and barked. It was an explosive bark, brief and joyous, but a bark. That's a new one on me, Skiff Miller remarked. Walt and Madge stared at each other. The miracle had happened. Wolf had barked. It's the first time he ever barked, Madge said. First time I ever heard him, too, Miller volunteered. Madge smiled at him. The man was evidently a humorist. Of course, she said, since you have only seen him for five minutes. Skiff Miller looked at her sharply, seeking in her face the guile her words had led him to suspect. I thought you understood, he said slowly. I thought you'd tumble to it from his marking up to me. He's my dog. His name ain't Wolf. It's Brown. Oh, Walt, was Madge's instinctive cry to her husband. Walt was on the defensive at once. How do you know he's your dog, he demanded. Because he is, was the reply. Mere assertion, Walt said sharply. In his slow and pondering way, Skiff Miller looked at him, then asked, with a nod of his head toward Madge. How do you know she's your wife? You just say, because she is, and I'll say it's mere assertion. The dog's mine. I bred him and raised him, and I guess I ought to know. Look here. 
I'll prove it to you. Skiff Miller turned to the dog. Brown. His voice rang out sharply, and at the sound the dog's ears flattened down as to a caress. Gee. The dog made a swinging turn to the right. Now mush on. And the dog ceased his swing abruptly and started straight ahead, halting obediently at command. I can do it with whistles, Skiff Miller said proudly. He was my lead dog. But you are not going to take him away with you. Madge asked tremulously. The man nodded. Back into that awful Klondike world of suffering. He nodded and added, oh, it ain't so bad as all that. Look at me. Pretty healthy specimen, ain't I? But the dogs. The terrible hardship, the heartbreaking toil, the starvation, the frost. Oh, I've read about it and I know. I nearly ate him once, over on Little Fish River, Miller volunteered grimly. If I hadn't got a moose that day was all that saved him. I'd have died first. Madge cried. Things is different down here, Miller explained. You don't have to eat dogs. You think different just about the time you're all in. You've never been all in, so you don't know anything about it. That's the very point, she argued warmly. Dogs are not eaten in California. Why not leave him here? He is happy. He'll never want for food, you know that. He'll never suffer from cold and hardship. Here all is softness and gentleness. Neither the human nor nature is savage. He will never know a whiplash again. And as for the weather, why, it never snows here. But it's all fired hot in summer, begged in your pardon, Skiff Miller laughed. But you do not answer, Madge continued passionately. What have you to offer him in that Northland life? Grub, when I've got it, and that's most of the time, came the answer. And the rest of the time? No grub. And the work? Yes, plenty of work, Miller blurted out impatiently. Work without end, and famine, and frost, and all the rest of the miseries, that's what he'll get when he comes with me. But he likes it. He's used to it. He knows that life. He was born to it and brought up to it. And you don't know anything about it. You don't know what you're talking about. That's where the dog belongs, and that's where he'll be happiest. The dog doesn't go, Walt announced in a determined voice. So there is no need of further discussion. What's that? Skiff Miller demanded his brows lowering and an obstinate flush of blood reddening his forehead. I said the dog doesn't go, and that settles it. I don't believe he's your dog. You may have seen him sometime. You may even sometime have driven him for his owner. But his obeying the ordinary driving commands of the Alaskan Trail is no demonstration that he is yours. Any dog in Alaska would obey you as he obeyed. Besides, he is undoubtedly a valuable dog, as dogs go in Alaska, and that is sufficient explanation of your desire to get possession of him. Anyway, you've got to prove property. Skiff Miller, cool and collected, the obstinate flush a trifle deeper on his forehead, his huge muscles bulging under the black cloth of his coat, carefully looked the poet up and down as though measuring the strength of his slenderness. The Klondiker's face took on a contemptuous expression as he said finally, I reckon there's nothing in sight to prevent me taking the dog right here and now. Walt's face reddened, and the striking muscles of his arms and shoulders seemed to stiffen and grow tense. His wife fluttered apprehensively into the breach. Maybe Mr. Miller is right, she said. I am afraid that he is. Wolf does seem to know him, and certainly he answers to the name of Brown. He made friends with him instantly and you know that's something he never did with anybody before. Besides, look at the way he barked. He was just bursting with joy joy over what? Without doubt at finding Mr. Miller. Walt's striking muscles relaxed, and his shoulders seemed to droop with hopelessness. I guess you're right, Madge, he said. 
Wolf isn't Wolf, but Brown, and he must belong to Mr. Miller. Perhaps Mr. Miller will sell him, she suggested. We can buy him. Skiff Miller shook his head, no longer belligerent, but kindly, quick to be generous in response to generousness. I had five dogs, he said, casting about for the easiest way to temper his refusal. He was the leader. They was the crack team of Alaska. Nothing could touch em. In 1898 I refused $5,000 for the bunch. Dogs was high, then, anyway, but that wasn't what made the fancy price. It was the team itself. Brown was the best in the team. That winter I refused 1200 for M. I didn't sell M then, and I ain't a selling M now. Besides, I think a mighty lot of that dog. I've been looking for M for three years. It made me fair sick when I found he'd been stole, not the value of him, but the well, I liked him like hell, that's all, beg Jin your pardon. I couldn't believe my eyes when I seen him just now. I thought I was Dre Amin. It was too good to be true. Why, I was his wet nurse. I put him to bed, snug every night. His mother died, and I brought him up on condensed milk at two dollars a can when I couldn't afford it in my own coffee. He never knew any mother but me. He used to suck my finger regular, the darn little cuss, that finger right there. And Skiff Miller, too overwrought for speech, held up a forefinger for them to see. That very finger, he managed to articulate, as though it somehow clinched the proof of ownership and the bond of affection. He was still gazing at his extended finger when Madge began to speak. But the dog, she said. You haven't considered the dog. Skiff Miller looked puzzled. Have you thought about him, she asked. Don't know what you're driving at, was the response. Maybe the dog has some choice in the matter, Madge went on. Maybe he has his likes and desires. You have not considered him. You give him no choice. It has never entered your mind that possibly he might prefer California to Alaska. You consider only what you like. You do with him as you would with a sack of potatoes or a bale of hay. This was a new way of looking at it, and Miller was visibly impressed as he debated it in his mind. Madge took advantage of his indecision. If you really love him, what would be happiness to him would be your happiness also, she urged. Skiff Miller continued to debate with himself, and Madge stole a glance of exultation to her husband, who looked back warm approval. What do you think, the Klondiker suddenly demanded. It was her turn to be puzzled. What do you mean, she asked. Do you think he'd sooner stay in California? She nodded her head with positiveness. I am sure of it. Skiff Miller again debated with himself, though this time aloud, at the same time running his gaze in a judicial way over the mooted animal. He was a good worker. He's done a heap of work for me. He never loafed on me, and he was a Joe Dandy at Hammer in a raw team into shape. He's got a head on him. He can do everything but talk. He knows what you say to him. Look at him now. He knows we're talking about him. The dog was lying at Skiff Miller's feet, head close down on paws, ears erect and listening, and eyes that were quick and eager to follow the sound of speech as it fell from the lips of first one and then the other. And there's a lot of work in him yet. He's good for years to come. And I do like him. I like him like hell. Once or twice after that Skiff Miller opened his mouth and closed it again without speaking. Finally he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Your remarks, hm, has some weight in them. The dog's worked hard, and maybe he's earned a soft berth and has got a right to choose. Anyway, we'll leave it up to him. Whatever he says, goes. You people stay right here set him down. I'll say goodbye and walk off casual like. If he wants to stay, he can stay. If he wants to come with me, let him come. I won't call M to come and don't you call M to come back. 
He looked with sudden suspicion at Madge, and added, only you must play fair. No persuading after my back is turned. We'll play fair, Madge began, but Skiff Miller broke in on her assurances. I know the ways of women, he announced. Their hearts is soft. When their hearts is touched they're likely to stack the cards, look at the bottom of the deck, and lie like the devil, begged in your pardon. Mm. I'm only discoursing about women in general. I don't know how to thank you, Madge quavered. I don't see as you've got any call to thank me, he replied. Brown ain't decided yet. Now you won't mind if I go away slow. It's no more unfair, seeing I'll be out of sight inside a hundred yards. Madge agreed, and added, and I promise you faithfully that we won't do anything to influence him. Well, then, I might as well be getting along, Skiff Miller said in the ordinary tones of one departing. At this change in his voice, Wolf lifted his head quickly, and still more quickly got to his feet when the man and woman shook hands. He sprang up on his hind legs, resting his four paws on her hip and at the same time licking Skiff Miller's hand. When the latter shook hands with Walt, Wolf repeated his act, resting his weight on Walt and licking both men's hands. It ain't no picnic, I can tell you that, were the Klondiker's last words, as he turned and went slowly up the trail. For the distance of twenty feet Wolf watched him go, himself all eagerness and expectancy, as though waiting for the man to turn and retrace his steps. Then, with a quick low whine, Wolf sprang after him, overtook him, caught his hand between his teeth with reluctant tenderness, and strove gently to make him pause. Failing in this, Wolf raced back to where Walt Irvine sat, catching his coat sleeve in his teeth and trying vainly to drag him after the retreating man. Wolf's perturbation began to wax. He desired ubiquity. He went to be in two places at the same time, with the old master and the new, and steadily the distance between them was increasing. He sprang about excitedly, making short nervous leaps and twists, now toward one, now toward the other, in painful indecision, not knowing his own mind, desiring both and unable to choose, uttering quick sharp whines and beginning to pant. He sat down abruptly on his haunches, thrusting his nose upward, the mouth opening and closing with jerking movements, each time opening wider. These jerking movements were in unison with the recurrent spasms that attacked the throat, each spasm severer and more intense than the preceding one. And in accord with jerks and spasms the larynx began to vibrate, at first silently, accompanied by the rush of air expelled from the lungs, then sounding a low, deep note, the lowest in the register of the human ear. All this was the nervous and muscular preliminary to howling. But just as the howl was on the verge of bursting from the full throat, the wide-opened mouth was closed, the paroxysm ceased, and he looked long and steadily at the retreating man. Suddenly Wolf turned his head, and over his shoulder just as steadily regarded Walt. The appeal was unanswered. Not a word nor a sign did the dog receive, no suggestion and no clue as to what his conduct should be. A glance ahead to where the old master was nearing the curve of the trail excited him again. He sprang to his feet with a whine, and then, struck by a new idea, turned his attention to Madge. Hitherto he had ignored her, but now, both masters failing him, she alone was left. He went over to her and snuggled his head in her lap, nudging her arm with his nose, an old trick of his when begging for favors. He backed away from her and began writhing and twisting playfully covetting and prancing, half-rearing and striking his four paws to the earth, struggling with all his body, from the wheedling eyes and flattening ears to the wagging tail, to express the thought that was in him and that was denied him utterance. This, too, he soon abandoned. He was depressed by the coldness of these humans who had never been cold before. No response could he draw from them, no help could he get. They did not consider him. They were as dead. He turned and silently gazed after the old master. Skiff Miller was rounding the curve. In a moment he would be gone from view. Yet he never turned his head, plodding straight onward, slowly and methodically, as though possessed of no interest in what was occurring behind his back. 
And in this fashion he went out of view. Wolf waited for him to reappear. He waited a long minute, silently, quietly, without movement, as though turned to stone, with all stone quick with eagerness and desire. He barked once, and waited. Then he turned and trotted back to Walt Irvine. He sniffed his hand and dropped down heavily at his feet, watching the trail where it curved emptily from view. The tiny stream slipping down the mossolipped stone seemed suddenly to increase the volume of its gurgling noise. Save for the meadowlarks, there was no other sound. The great yellow butterflies drifted silently through the sunshine and lost themselves in the drowsy shadows. Madge gazed triumphantly at her husband. A few minutes later Wolf got upon his feet. Decision and deliberation marked his movements. He did not glance at the man and woman. His eyes were fixed up the trail. He had made up his mind. They knew it. And they knew, so far as they were concerned, that the ordeal had just begun. He broke into a trot, and Madge's lips passed, forming an avenue for the caressing sound that it was the will of her to send forth. But the caressing sound was not made. She was impelled to look at her husband, and she saw the sternness with which he watched her. The pursed lips relaxed, and she sighed inaudibly. Wolf's trot broke into a run. Wider and wider were the leaps he made. Not once did he turn his head, his wolf's brush standing out straight behind him. He cut sharply across the curve of the trail and was gone.